Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. And welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm your host, Frank. I'm here joining my buddy, Neil, as usual. And, uh, you know, Neil, crazy times. This is the weekend before the 2020 presidential election here in America. And uh, it's crazy out there. And uh, it really highlights, really, all the things that are going on in our civilization right now. Some of the things that are kind of crazy, these two diametrically opposed ideologies that are at each other's throats when we talk about, you know, the classical liberal civilization. And we kind of Catholics or integralists or traditionalists, whatever you want to call us, are kind of on the outside looking in and say, both you guys are crazy in one capacity or another. Now, granted, the left far more crazier than the right, but, you know, I guess tonight's show, what I want to touch upon is when we look at all the circumstances in the world, sort of the geopolitical craziness, the breakdown of the culture, the breakdown of the family, or should I say really the utter ruin of the family at this point in history, it all coincides, in my opinion, with the great loss of faith throughout the world, particularly the loss of faith of the, you know, the great Holy Roman Catholic Church, which, um, you know, a lot of us would say, well, something went wrong. Right around the time of Vatican II, a few years before, maybe a few years after, right around there. And as, you know, we Catholics believe in lots of prophecy, particularly the prophecies of Our Lady, Our Lady of Fatima. You know, Our Lady of Fatima predicted world, the end of world. She predicted that the start of, of another great war if man didn't repent. And in a few other prophecies, including one, you know, one secret of Fatima that's never been fully revealed from what I understand. Um, and, and, you know, you combine that with other prophecies like Our Lady of Good Success, Our Lady of La Salette, which talked about the church in many respects going dark and the posse starting at the top of the church, which, of course, you know, if it starts at the top of the church, it's only natural that it descends down to the laity. I mean, the more I look around at the craziness of the world. Again, the collapse of the culture, the ruination of the family, the, the abject corruptness of the system. It seems to me we're living in a period of darkness. Now, I know every generation says, these are the last days. These are the last days. But now I'm looking around me. I see everybody has lost the faith. Nobody's going to church anymore. Okay? Nobody's even partaking of the sacraments anymore. Evil is overtly all over the world, out in public in many respects, and yet nobody seems to have an answer how we bring order back to our civilization, Neil. Do you sense what I sense, that there is a dark cloud that has descended all over the world over the past century? And my question for you is this, is this the century of Our Lady and her prophecies? Well, it certainly feels like, uh, I shouldn't say feels, it, it seems that we are in a state of great apostasy. And I don't know if it's ever been on this level before in history. I mean, we've had times of bad popes and, doing, and bishops doing horrible things, um, but I don't know if there's been a time when so many of the faithful have been unfaithful, you know, have believed false teachings and still consider themselves Catholic, you know. So it's a kind of uh, an apostasy of belief. They don't even know they're an apostasy. I think a lot of people, or at least they don't think they are, based on the fact that a lot of them still try to call themselves Catholic or Christian or whatever, but they hold beliefs that are not in adherence with the faith. So I, I just don't know if there's ever been a time like this in history. And you mentioned Fatima and... It all seems to 
it seems like it can be connected to not following through with what Our Lady asked. And I think we're all to blame for that. It's not just one pope or one bishop or this, you know. I think we've all, in different ways, failed to live up to it. I mean, how many of us still uh, do the first five Saturdays, you know? How many of us do uh, a daily rosary and and this kind of thing? Uh, I'm sure a lot of people do, but there's still many, many, many more who don't and have not followed that message and have not been obedient, especially within the church hierarchy, but also us laity. I mean, we only need to reflect upon our own sinfulness, right, to, to see where we've fallen short. And can we be surprised when punishment follows? And Our Lady even warned of that, if this is not going to be listened to, that punishment will come. And the kind of punishment we get is what we're seeing, bad leadership, apostasy, uh, just everything falling apart everywhere, the family falling apart. Uh, and the church being under attack. And the, the greatest attacks that we can undergo are not so much physical attacks, but rather the loss of moral ground and the loss of the truth and living out the truth. So I, I don't know. It's, it's a very uh, discouraging time. And I just don't know there's ever been a time like it before. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the most frustrating things with me is when you run into the ex-Catholics. And one of my big things, Neil, is uh, is the devastating effects that Protestantism has had on Catholicism, especially in America. You know, we've talked about it before. Protestantism in America is, is a strange kind of phenomenon where, again, through these this concept of religious liberty, it is it has expanded and in ways that it, it never really expanded in Europe, the Protestants did. And um, they've been able to tinker with faith and religion and their own biblical interpretations to really take effect in many respects uh, on Catholics and, and, and really pick off Catholics one by one, particularly in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. They did a great job of taking what I would consider weak-minded Catholic Catholics, Catholics that, that were always really assured and strong in their faith. Uh, this this simple message of you know me and Jesus you know sola scriptura and and just have faith kind of stuff we saw many of our Catholic brethren uh, flee for prostitutes but then we've also had those that have just have lost the faith altogether and, and I find that interesting specifically when you have ex Catholics that have left the church that begin to criticize the church for a lot of its internal problems, whether it's the, the pedophilia or the pederasty and the, the child rape and, you know, the corruption, the Vatican scandals and the bank and all that stuff. We hear it all, all kinds of excuses why ex-Catholics don't want to be obedient to Holy Mother Church. But the bottom line is, is that we're living in this strange time where the weakening of the church, in many respects, you can blame the clergy and this apostasy that it starts from the very top, as Our Lady talked about, but at the same time, it's also weakened precisely because her sons have abandoned the church. Her son, sons and daughters have abandoned Holy Mother Church. That's my point. If we had faithful Catholics that remain strong in their faith, uh, you know, where if this apostasy wasn't as prevalent as we see today, that we could probably maintain order better, but because the vast majority have lost the faith, even some of those that have stayed and become lukewarm, you know, in the Novus Ordo churches are not fighting the fight that needs to be fought. You know, they'll look at something like Fatima and say, oh, okay, the Fatima prophecy, it's over, it's done, okay, the yeah. Vatican. But when you go deeper into it, you say to yourself, okay, but if the Fatima prophecy is over, why does the world even look worse than what it did than before the prophecy was prophesied mm -hmm. over? See, because something doesn't feel quite right because this apostasy is rampant and most of it is coming from ex-Catholics who have abandoned Holy Mother Church. Yeah, and you know, when I look at Fatima and the prophecy and, and other prophecies, really, and then if it's fulfilled then I, it makes me think, well, Fatima's not a legitimate uh, apparition. Because I'm going, in what way were the promises fulfilled? You know, well, her, if you don't do this, then the lies of Russia, communism, will spread. And then I'm told, well, we did do it, so we're good. Really? Because I'm still seeing it spread. Um, 
I'm I'm still seeing the apostasy and destruction of the, of the family in the church. And well, so did Mary lie, or because you're telling me we fulfilled what she asked, and all of this stuff is still happening. Uh, so either she's it wasn't a reparation; she lied, or we didn't do what was asked. I and, think. I think what they would say, I've heard this argument before, what they would say is, is that you're invoking your own vision of what the world should look like after this, the consecration happened in 1984. The fact is the Soviet Union did collapse after 1984. Thus, you know, that, you know, that should be taken into account. And because there's all kinds of other crazy things going on, that doesn't necessarily mean that Our Lady's prophecy wasn't fulfilled and the third secret fulfilled. Well, but yeah, but Russia's still communist, is it not? And is that communism not spreading throughout the world? And wasn't it, the, think, pro wasn't it the promise that the lies of Russia, a.k.a. communism, would, would spread if we didn't fulfill it, thus implying it would not spread if we did? Or was it only against the Soviet Union? Well, because I think that I think that's the key. I think you're bringing it up because what does it mean? Is the Soviet Union collapsing symbolic of that prophecy being fulfilled? But what we actually saw was the heirs of Russia spread, and we see this spread all over the world. And now a yeah, lot of our spreading. classical liberal friends, yeah, our, our, a lot of classical liberal friends don't want to believe this, but the heirs of Russia are here in America. It's quite clear they're here Antifa, in America. As we, BLM. Well, even within our government, even yeah. the way we dis redistribute wealth, taking governmental control, not honor what, what is Catholic tradition, local subsidiary and small governance. Uh, we see m mass wealth redistribution. And then we see cultural Marxism, the destruction of the family, particularly to, through these libertine sort of values that Marxism always sort of procured in order to destroy the family. It starts in Russia. Uh, or, or should I say the Soviet Union, and it's spread throughout all of the world. Listen, it's the entire world right now is practicing sodomy and abortion and divorce and remarriage, everything that effectively attacks and destroys the family, that a lot of it really was started during the time of the old Soviet Union, is all over the West now. In fact, in fact, you can see the Eastern Bloc nations who in some ways... The faith was incubated there in Hungary, Poland, and even Russia to a certain extent. They look at us now in the West and say, you guys have lost your minds. We lived under the sort of ideology that is dominating you. And, and, and Western liberalism, it's a joke because it's been transferred over to the West. A lot of that old kind of, you know, communist ideology, Neil. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that, that's my point, though. It's like, we're still seeing it. So what exactly, if it's fulfilled, then I don't see how the world is any better, really. I mean, because that the Soviet Union is no longer does not change the fact that the errors of it are still there and still are spreading and have spread here. Uh, not that America is the measuring tool for everything, but... The point is, I'm still seeing the spread. So, I mean, convince me. How how was it fulfilled? And fa and I've been listening also to uh, the other side that points out that Our Lady wanted it fulfilled in a specific way, and that specific way was not followed. So, and then immediately after that, we have all the confusion of Vatican II. We have uh, the basically the downfall of the Church uh, around the world. Uh, so that's, I mean, why didn't she at least warn us about that, you know, and go, oh, by the way, you're still going to see this stuff regardless of what you do. <laughs> yeah, I think, too, when you talk about specifically certain apparitions, um, I'll go back to La Salette, where Our Lady specifically stated that Rome would lose the faith. And here we are in the midst of, a, of an apostasy that, that seems to have hit hard in the Vatican itself, you know. Um, it, it's something that's kind of been laid out for us, and we're all looking back here. We're looking at these prophecies, and we're looking at what's happening in the Vatican today, and there's a lot of us that are very confused. Now, I know, listen, there's lots of nuances in these apparitions, these prophecies, because, you know, you, we're, we're 
you know, we're dealing with interpretive principles, okay? And I'll be the first to acknowledge, you know, even with an apparition like La Salette, you know, when you have messages that happen sort of immediately after, during the aftermath of the apparitions, and then 30 years later, the, the seers begin to give out more messages, and, and people get kind of confused as to, you know, which ones are valid, which ones are invalid. But I think we can look at these apparitions, and again, and go all the way back to Quito, and begin to see our lady lay out a time Neil, where the the all the customs of the world will become corrupt, things from you know impurity to impiety to heresy that these things will consume the world like never before. And I go back to what I keep saying about my classical liberal friends and their sort of religious indifferentism. Um, and I think you pointed this out earlier. Show me a time and era in human history where the faith has suffered so severely, so deeply, particularly when you compare and contrast it to the old Christian world, to Christendom. Uh, in fact, you can argue that the faith was very strong. Sure, we have moments like during maybe Renaissance where the faith kind of went up and down. We had some corruption. I get that. But for the most part, throughout the history of Christendom, the faith remains strong. And here we are some 200, let's call it 250 years after the revolutions of the Masons and the classical liberals, and the faith has absolute collapse all over the world, Neil, including most hard hit other Protestant nations, Neil. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a loss all around. And it just boggles the mind to see it getting this bad and reaching the highest places of the church, too. And I mean, we're seeing faithful Catholics either leaving the church or at the very least being divisive over uh, what things the Pope are saying. Uh, people you never would have thought you would have heard a negative word out of them, and all of yeah. a sudden they're back in stuff that is clearly wrong because of some confusing statement the Pope made. Uh, you got people bidding over backwards to defend every statement the Pope makes. Uh, and then, so that's, start, that's causing infighting even within the church, the, uh, among those you would consider faithful. So it's this mass confusion and disruption of the truth. And it's just, it's just a very hard time right now. Uh, I mean, they said that, uh, who was it, the saint that said the, the final battle will be over the family? And I can't think of a time where that's been more true now. That's, that's Sister Lucy of Fatima. Well, oh, there you go. Yeah, Sister Lucy. Um, let me let me go back here to Our Lady of uh, Good Success. Um, I mean, these are just some of the concepts that she presented back in the 17th century. She said, quote, unbridled passions will give way to a total corruption of customs because Satan will reign through the Masonic sex, targeting the children in particular to ensure general corruption. Unhappy the children of those times, seldom will they receive the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. As for the sacrament of penance, they will confess only while attending Catholic schools, which the devil will do his utmost to destroy by means of persons in authority. The same will occur with Holy Communion. Oh, how it hurts me to tell you that there will be many and enormous public and hidden sacrileges. In those times, the sacrament of extreme unction will be largely ignored. Many will die without receiving it, being thereby deprived of innumerable graces, consolation, and strength in the great leap from time to eternity. The sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with the church, will be thoroughly attacked and profaned. Masonry, then, reigning, will implement iniquitous laws aimed at extinguishing the sacrament. They will make it easy for all to live in sin, thus multiplying the birth of illegitimate children without the church's blessings. Secular education will contribute to a scarcity of priestly and religious vocations. The holy sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, despised, for in this both the church and God himself are oppressed and reviled, since he is represented 
by his priests. The devil will work to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every way, working with baneful cunning to destroy the spirit of their vocation and corrupting many. Those who will just scandalize the Christian flock will bring upon all priests the hatred of bad Christians and the enemies of the one holy Roman Catholic and apostolic church. This apparent triumph of Satan will cause enormous suffering to the good pastors of the church and to the street. To, and to the supreme pastor and vicar of Christ on earth, a prisoner in the Vatican will uh, shed the secret and bitter tears in the presence of our good Lord, asking for light, sanctity, and perfection for all the clergy of the world to whom he is king and father. Neil, that's why I say this is 17th century here. This is 17th century laying out the 20th and the 21st century here. We go through every one of these issues and all these prophecies have come true. Starting with, again, let's, let's go to the corruption of marriage. We've seen that just in our day, in our lifetime alone. Not just with sodomy, as we've, you know, as, as it's so obvious with the legalizing of gay marriage all over the place. But, but even within us Catholics, how we don't even take that sacrament seriously anymore. We intermix with Protestants and Jews and and and, and, and different faiths. Uh, we don't show up to church to have a sacramental marriage. We got you know Elvis Presley walking us down the mm -hmm. aisle, and we've talked about this before. Contraceptives, um, you know, contraceptives. I mean, this is quite amazing here. What our lady lays out. I, I, here's another one, and, and I'll leave you with this, and I'll let you tee off on this. But the the sacrament of extreme unction. I can't tell you how many, not just non-Catholics, but Catholics that were raised in the faith sit by, watch by, and they, they're watching a parent on their deathbed in their last days, and they would do everything but call a priest to get the sacrament of holy orders before their, their, their supposed mm -hmm. beloved parent passes on to the next world, Neil. I mean, that's how far we've fallen. I mean, this is Catholicism 101. Your parent or your child or anybody you love is about to pass on to the next world. You call the priest for the sacrament of, of you know, of unction there to get the final graces they need, Neil. And yet we've lost the faith so much that we don't even do that. We don't, it's not even second nature anymore, Neil. Well, that's because the soul is not important either. I mean, that's... We place the, the care of the body over the spirit, that we have this cult of the body that we seem to be yeah. obsessed with, and we also don't believe in hell anymore. We, we, I mean, when our bishop is saying, well, there's a reasonable hope that all are saved, Bishop Robert Barron, uh, well, then what do I care? I mean, wh why do I struggle to be, be righteous? Why do I care about being a saint? if at all possible, you know? Well, we're all going to heaven anyway. So, what, what, they, they, I don't know where they get this from. I, I don't know where they're pulling it from half the time. It, you have to be an intellectual to run into those kind of errors. You have to be. You have to be so educated you can't see straight. Because to even think that, all right, on this earth, we have a concept of judgment for wrong action. Yet God doesn't? That does, what, what sense does that make? And then on top of that, that, that in and of itself means, well, the wrongs we do that, like breaking the law, is more serious than breaking eternal laws. Because at least here you go to jail for such things, maybe. Uh... In the next life, well, well, we're all going to get a good reward, but don't get any bad rewards for our actions, which is completely contrary to Scripture. Uh, so, so if you don't have a belief in the possibility of condemnation, of damnation, well, then the rest of it is just feel-good talk. And if you're not making me feel good, then I don't, I'm not going to assent to it. I'm not going to pretend like it's not real. Like I don't believe in it. Uh, and that also goes back to our image of Jesus half the time is, you know, meek and mild Jesus, you know, timid. You know, where's our crucifixes? You know, with the bloody ones, too. That's why I like having my big old bloody crucifix on the wall there. Because it's because life is there. You know, that's the real, that's reality. Okay? You're going to get scourged. 
All right. And if and if you're going to drop out when it's hard, then you were never in it to begin with. So. I don't know. I think I think like uh, Maliki Martin said, um, they just lost the faith. They've, they've just they've lost the faith. Let me ask you a question here. We got a like I said, when we started the show, Neil, we have a presidential election that's uh, well, three days, four days away right now. And I'm hearing from many of my classical liberal friends that if Donald Trump loses this election, the country's done. It's over. I guess my question is this. Why is it that the classical liberals, they see something is wrong with the country? Okay. And many of our fellow Catholics, not just classical, it's many of our fellow Catholics. Everybody knows something has gone wrong. We can look at the culture. We can look at the corrupt institutions. We can look at the destruction of the family. What is it that puts people, in your opinion, in denial about the reality of life? What is, is it? Have we all been bought out by material success? Have we all been bought out by our pleasures? Is that all that matters at this point in time? Because I think we see it, I think me and you, and many of our fellow Catholic integralists, but there's many out there, they know it's wrong, but they can't find it in themselves to look as to why, and, and you would think that the first place they would look is the faith, but they're not. Why? Because God has become indifferent to them. Neil? I think... Uh, spiritually, I think it's a lack of grace because the definition of, of what grace does is that it enlightens the mind. And we're running into people who, no matter how reasonably you explain the truth, no matter how clearly and simply you put it, you don't have to use high fluting words, they just can't grasp it. They, they you just can't get it. And I feel like it's a lack of grace that the mind has darkened. I mean, the issue of abortion is very straightforward. It's clear. There, there's no ambiguity there. Yeah. It is just straightforward. Yet you still have people who cannot grasp that concept, even among Catholics, I see, apparently, uh, with this election cycle. So I think it, it really is this lack of grace that is just darkening the mind. Now, materially speaking, I, I, there's a part of me that thinks like uh, I, there was a quote that Chesterton said. I can't remember how it goes exactly, but he's making the point that it's a, it's, it's a result of having it too good. You know, we, we, have it, we have it really good, materially speaking. Yeah. And so there's a kind of uh, apathy that sets in. I'm comfortable. And so it's easier to be blind. It's easier to be a fool, you know, and not be wise when you have all the creature comforts. And I am as guilty of it as anyone. I love my computer, okay? <laughs> you know, I like my fancy phone, uh, even though it ticks me off because it runs so slow at times. But yeah. I, even, even that, though, I say it's slow. But I remember I had dial-up when I was a kid, all right? And it took 30 minutes just to log on. All right. And this thing delays five seconds, 10 seconds, and I'm angry. You know, <laughs> well, I'm just so, so I, it's a I sin got, that I'm well, guilty of. You know, I, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, mere, I'm materialistic in a lot of ways. Hey, listen, I, I listen, I, I'm guilty of that, too. I'm not going to lie to you. I got a beautiful 55 inch TV in my uh, in my living room where HD and I get all that stuff. And I went to Walmart the other day and I saw not only the 65 inch, I saw yeah. the 70. Five inch, okay. Man, that looks I'm like, portable. that would look good in my living room. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and, so, and, then, and then, then I could justify it with man, if I put adoration up on that TV, it'll make the look holy. I could, this, I, could, I could put on YouTube and put on my rosary, <laughs> and it look good up there, man. Right, right. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'm at the point where I see a 55 inch screen. I'm going, can I hook that up to my computer? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's great. That, it's, see, this is the crazy times we live in. And that's that's why I say it's very strange. And, and I think people have learned to rationalize away their, their sins in many respects. And, and, I, and I do believe that the classical liberal civilization, particularly the effect Protestantism has had in America, um, where, where God is just this, you know, this abstract idea that 
you know, as long as I'm, you know, as long as I obey certain principles or have faith that everything's going to be okay. He's not a mean God. He's not a judgmental God. He doesn't get caught up in all the little, you know, the little things are, you know, specifically with, with human flaws. No, 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 no. He's, he, he's a God that he understands. That, he understands. <laughs> he he's it. cool. He's cool with that, you know? <laughs> you know, and and I, and I think that's played a big a big effect. I've seen that even with a lot of Catholics, where they will tell you, well, you know, these ritualistic things that the Catholics do or that the Church used to do, like go to yeah. confession or receive communion. I mean, those are pagan ideas, anyways, right, Neil? Yeah, I mean, you just need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and you'll be fine. Um, it's. Uh, I'm about to say, if God, if Jesus actually taught that, that is a profound ignorance on on by God of man, yeah. because we need material ways in order to reach spiritual things. God doesn't need them; we do. God uses those things because we need them. And if Jesus was like, "Listen, all you need to do is have this emotional, spiritual." Relationship, personal relationship with me. You don't got to worry about going to the sacraments. Those are physical pagan things. A part of me question going, but I need those things. How are you relating to me as a human, a material being? You just, I'm just, what, I'm going to think about it? And, okay, I'm forgiven now. Oh, how comforting that is, too. They're just, okay, I'm good. All right. Yeah, 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 I know. Still going to get to heaven. All right. Man, I was close. Now, don't get me wrong. There's an aspect to that that may be true. And what I mean yes. by that is when you commit a sin, you should immediately follow that up with an act of contrition. Yes. Because if you're unable to get to confession, you can still go to heaven through purgatory. Uh, you know, you, do, you still have to be purged. Because then it's a kind of like a baptism of desire. It's like a confession of desire. Because what is your intent to go to confession? You were prevented in some way, and in God's mercy, you can still receive forgiveness because well, that's what you were oriented towards anyway. Okay, but see, I think you hit on something here. And it hits on the theme of this particular show and what I'm trying to get at here. Because I think what you're describing is a modern phenomenon within modernity, and I think it goes back, again, to the Enlightenment and the classical liberal revolution, where I think what they're saying is, is that sin doesn't exist anymore. We don't yeah. acknowledge sin anymore. That's the danger. Because yes. what I described was a repentant person. Yes. But if you don't believe in sin, you're not repenting of anything. And when you die unrepentantly... That's hell. Yes. And by the way, you know, some people used to say, well, you know, you close your eyes, you're going to see Jesus, and you better know what decision you're going to make. No, your decision was made all the moments of your life. Once those eyes close and you die, there's no more decision making. You don't go, oh, oh, yeah, I'm going to go with Jesus. It's too late. You're dead. Yeah. You're, well, you're, you're, wait, wait. What is the Bible verse? Um, something like uh, not everybody says Lord, Lord. You know, I, you know, something like uh, they won't go into the kingdom of heaven or something like that. Yeah, not everybody says verse? Lord, Lord, I'll be saved be because I mean, I, I knew you not. You know, yeah. I did not know you. Depart from me, you evil ones. It's like yeah. once you die, the decision's already made. The only thing you're you're going to hear is the pronouncement of the judgment. You know, if if that at all, I mean, the the very scary uh, image, at least I felt, was always terrifying to me when I heard it. it was when Archbishop Fulton Sheen would say, "There's a he." The way he said it was, "It's on YouTube. You can find it." I can't remember the name of the video, but he's going, "There's uh, ten thousand upon ten thousand roads that you may travel on this life, and it really doesn't matter which road you travel. At the end of that life." you will see one of two faces, either the beautiful face of Christ or the horrible face of Satan. And either one of them will tell you mine. Now, you close your eyes and you see that horrible face, 
looking, looking you dead in your own eyes and telling you, mine. That's it. It's done. There's no hope. That is true despair. There really is no hope. You're gone. Yeah. And you need to realize what sin is and what the very serious consequences are. Every time I fall into a sin, I am terrified of my own soul because I start to think, you know, all this time I've been trying to serve God and here it is, I commit this sin and I throw it all away. It's like, what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, get back. You better find a confession quick. <laughs> You know? but the classical liberal, but the indifferent classical liberal will say to you in response to that, Neil, why do you think so little of God? Why do you make God so little? Why do you reduce God down to your own individual fallible nature? And thus, God can see above who you are. He can judge your heart. He can judge your soul, despite all these flaws that you may have within you. You really diminish God when you treat yourself that way, Neil. No, what it is is I have made a decision to cut that relationship with Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how big God is. I made a decision to remove myself from communion with Jesus Christ. That's not, that's not a size of God. I mean, that, it's not like Sin is not God going, listen, I'm going to hold a grudge against you. No, it, sin is you committed an action that has a consequence. That consequence being, depending on the, uh, the severity of the sin, could be venial, could be mortal, all right, leads to the destruction of your communion with God. It's a rejection of your baptism, all right? Now, God can do anything, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how powerful God is or how big God is. When I have been given this uh, ability to reject him. And so it's an honoring, you could say, of God in that sense because it's, it's, it's obeying his commandments. And if you love God, you will obey his commandments. That's what it's boiling down to. You don't obey his commandments. You're showing a that you don't love God, you love yourself over God. And there has to be a consequence. It's not, well, and once again, it's not daddy going, you know, I don't like that. So I'm going to punish you. It's you choosing to leave. He says, yeah. okay, I can't force you. Well, but, I can't, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, I think that idea brings us full circle about what, what I want to talk about tonight. And that is our ladies, our ladies prophecy in her time. Because I think one of the general ideas that we've seen in modernity is this anti authoritarian movement that it begins at the protestant reformation that rebels because it doesn't want to follow a certain sort of dictates of god and it concocts the sola fide uh thing to where god effectively becomes sort of whatever you want it to be in your mind hence we see all the, the splintering denominations we, that naturally leads to the enlightenment period and the classical liberal revolutions who reject all authority together it starts by rejecting god then it, it extrapolates out to rejecting sort of the, the old monarchs, the, the divinely appointed monarchs, and this movement becomes anti-authoritarian at its very core. And I think that's one of the things that we Americans suffer from. I mean, you hear it a lot specifically from the American right. I'm an American, kiss my ass, kind of an attitude. I don't follow anybody. I'm an individual. I have my rights kind of a thing. And it's because, see, that, that kind of idea, it leads to a, a dangerous precedence. And that is once you begin to go down the path of rejecting all authority other than your own, it naturally leads to rejecting God. It naturally leads re the rejection of the commandments of God. And this is what we've seen starting at the, at the Protestant Reformation and kind of, you know, processing all the way through the Enlightenment and through modernity. I mean, this is why I say when you look at the modern constitutions, of the classical liberals or the Freemasons, whatever you want to call it, how many of these documents, especially like in the American Constitution, for example, how many, first of all, acknowledge the, the, the not the creator, but Jesus Christ, the Trinity? And secondly, how many of these constitutions actually acknowledge sin? They don't. They don't even deal with the fallen nature of man. And it's one of the reasons why I believe we've reached such a boiling point in our civilization because even in our own constitution, while I may agree with some of its 
principles. It doesn't know how to deal with the fallen nature of man. It simply left morality and religion, you know, in a private sphere. I get to pick and choose my own rules. I get to pick and choose my own moral codes. And we see where that's. So that's why we're here today. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to highlight here tonight. How do we bring this back? My ultimate point is, is that we've gone down since the Protestant Reformation through the Enlightenment and now in modernity through a path where we don't even acknowledge sin anymore. In fact, sin doesn't even exist. And God accommodates us. We get to do what we want. And at the end of the day, God has to honor us. It really is one of the grand blasphemies of all of human civilization, Neil. Yeah, and going to the sacraments confession, it, it's um, you humble yourself. Yeah. You, you have to humble yourself and say what you did. And that's not making God small, it's making yourself small in order to receive the mercy that he's waiting to give you. I mean... And these documents of the like the founding, I find it funny that we always try to say it's a Christian nation. But then when I look at the documents, I say, well, of course it's secular. That's the best way to do it, a secular government. Well, hold on. Are we Christian or are we secular? I mean, you can't have both ways. Apparently, we're both Christian and secular at the same time uh, in their minds. But it's a ridiculous concept. You can't have both like that. I mean, not in the sense that the, the, the nation has to pick what it is. You may have secular leaders and secular laws, but the nation has to say, okay, no, we're going to be secular, and that's all we are, or we're a Christian nation, and our laws are formed by that. But you can't say, yes, we're godless, which is secular, and the whole meaning of the word secular is not religious, and then at the same time claim you're Christian. Yeah. Uh, that's like the, a secular Catholic church. That doesn't make any sense. It, it's a, it doesn't follow, you know. Um, it's an oxymoron. So I, and it just goes to show you why we're in such troubles because we've kicked out God, we've kicked out religion, we don't acknowledge the truth, we put error on the same pedestal as truth. You know, the error has rights. I mean, you get the likes of Glenn Beck saying truth has to be the uh, decided by the individual. Uh, which ties in greatly to the whole idea of Americanism and this radical individualism. So what did Jesus say? You want nations to change, first hearts must change. Yeah. I think, I think what you bring up, and I think this is where we're at in modern times, is I think we're in a, in a basic sort of violation of the very first commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Mm -hmm. See, Neil, when you when you start a country and you begin to put the principles of this nation that you're founding here together, the very first thing you have to do is acknowledge eternal truth. And all these constitutions, with the exception of maybe one or two, um, and, and those are more recent um, constitutions are put together. Like, for example, Ireland acknowledges the Trinity. I believe Poland acknowledges Jesus Christ and, and nations that way. But the American Constitution doesn't acknowledge Jesus Christ at all. It doesn't even mention which God we are honoring. It's a general grand creator. It's an abstract God. So you already begin with a massive default. You don't know what the rules of the game are. You don't know how to lead your people at this point. You don't have any understandings of what eternal truth is. And all you can do is appeal to their basic natural instincts. And this is why we become a nation simply of economic alliances, to appease the most naturalistic elements of our life. And we leave the afterlife to individual interpretation. And here we are. This is what I keep saying. We want to talk about history, particularly Old history, Neil, and I see this all the time for the classical, how horrible life was in the old world under Christendom. And it's yeah. interesting because we didn't see this kind of apostasy. The apostasy we see today is the apostasy of the classical liberal revolution. And the Masons ultimately is what this is, and the Protestants for that matter. Show me a time of godlessness to this degree. The classical liberals will tell me, hey, here's all the great stuff. 
prosperity, freedom, technology, you know, great medicines, all this stuff. Yeah, but what about the culture and the family? That's never been worse throughout the history of human civilization. You want to take claims to all the natural things of life that the classical liberal world has given me, and I will counter you with the destruction of the family, where most of us don't even identify with any kind of sort of ancestry lineage anymore. Where it's like, you know, it's like I was talking to a friend of mine today, you know, good person, she tells you, yeah, I'm a Mormon, oh, but my ancestors who came from Ireland, they were Catholics. And I'm just thinking to myself, well, my ancestors all believe in one thing. There's one consistent belief that goes all the way back. Now, granted, I'm only one generation here as, as, as a son of an Italian immigrant here. So there's a more of a direct line. But it goes back to what I've said. Once we begin to separate who we are from our past, and that's what the Protestant reformers did. They, 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 they cut the cord of ancestry and, and sort of the genealogical faith, what I call, um, what's it called? The analogy of the faith. And then the classical liberals take that to the next step. Not only by, see, the Protestant reformers, Neil, they cut the line of truth in Christianity. They cut the line of truth of what Christianity actually is. The classical liberals and the Masons took it to the next step. They cut the cord into who God is. They made it indifferent. They erased his name from the history books to where now, not only do we not know who God is, not only do we not acknowledge God, but we as individuals, like our, even our constitutions suggest, we have individual rights. We get to make up our own God as we go. The very fact that the, the first commandment, in my opinion, that says you shall love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The first commandment is what, Neil? To acknowledge the one true God. And we now live in a civilization where we don't do that. We just make it up as we go along, as we see fit. Yeah, we're, we have a, we're in a place where we value individual rights, which we do have, but we value it over our duties. And the thing is, we have a duty to God, first and foremost— which is the first commandment, like you just pointed out, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind, that's that you have a duty to God. And I could claim all day long that I, I have a right to not suffer the uh, way my wife speaks to me. So I'm going to leave. Hold on. I have a duty to live up to my wedding vows. Whether I like it or not, half the time, you know, whether yeah. whether I like how I'm being treated or not, my duty comes first. That doesn't ignore, you know, individual rights, but understand that the rights that you have are kind of flow from your duties. And because we've gotten away from that, all you're left is, is me, me, me. What am I owed? What's mine to take? Yeah. You know? And when that gets abused or violated, well, we just want to quit on whatever we're doing, just walk out. Well, then I'm not doing it because it's violating my rights. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, what about your responsibilities, your duties, you know, like to yeah. your children? Well, I think, Neil, as we wrap this uh, show up tonight, I think when we look at our civilization and the other corruption, destruction of the family, the loss of faith in every major institution uh, at this point in time, the, the sheer confusion and the panic that's kicking into the hearts and minds of many uh, of our friends, whether they be on the political right or or, or Novus Ordo Catholics, I think it comes down to one issue, and, and I try to point this out tonight. Again, the first commandment is to acknowledge and to love the one true God, and it's something in this civilization we've never done. I think that's what our Lady's message, whether it's Fatima or La Salette or Our Lady of Good Success, she's pointed out. There was another apparition where she said that the, great, the three great sins that would send the most people to hell, impurity, impiety, and heresy. Not only are we living all those out in the modern age, my friend, but we have taken those uh, to the extreme. Uh, yeah. We live in a day and age where we um, have put those uh, sins really on steroids at this point in time. We don't acknowledge the one true God. We have no public veneration, and we've lost the faith. And I think as a result of that, 
mankind has lost its way and this confusion that exists throughout all of the culture. Again, with the broken culture, broken family, broken individuals. Uh, you go down the, the, the statistical lines if you want to go down that path. I don't think you need to. It's like I keep saying, you don't even got to look at your neighbor across the street. Just look at your own family, the doctrinal and the turmoil within your own family. I don't think anybody is, is, is protecting their family at this point in time um, with all the confusion and the lack of grace and the lack of sort of reverence we have to God. Every All families are breaking down at this point. And this is why I believe there's only going to be a small remnant at this, you know, not only just now, really, for that matter of fact, that's trying to protect the faith. We're living in a great time of apostasy. Our Lady warned us, Neil, and yet most of us, we still have the blinders on. We can't figure it out. Your final thoughts, my friend. Uh, I really don't know what to say because uh, the the state of things today is just, I think it's beyond any natural solution. There's just, there's nothing we can do naturally at this point to, uh, to set things right. Uh, and I, I guess I'm becoming, uh, trying to be more and more focused with getting my own piety right, my own... Yeah. spiritual life. Um, and the more I, we look at these issues, the more I look back on myself and I go, well, how have you been living your life? Yeah. You know, what things have you been doing and falling short in? And, um, and that's one of the reasons going to confession regularly helps because it forces you to look at and go, you know what? I haven't been helping this situation either by the way I've been living and the things I've been saying and doing at times in my own personal life and whatnot. Uh, but that's also the beauty of the faith is that we recognize the things we do wrong. We confess them and make a firm affirmation to not do it anymore. And when, if we, if it or when we do do it again, we get back up and you try again. We fall down like Batman in the movie. Why we fall down to learn how to get back up, you know? It's it's you get back up, you dust it off, try again. And that's the whole point is that you keep pushing forward to be better. And when when I say better, it's not just being some kind of a humanistic kind of idea of better, just being a good person, but being a holy person. And that means drawing closer to the Trinity. And that's one of the reasons uh, Mary is so helpful is because she at – sometimes we can see God as the angry father, right? And it helps to have that feminine image. Yeah, it does. To say, you know, to say come here, son. It's okay. You know, dust you off. You know, wipe your face, <laughs> you know, and say, come on, get back up. Let's do this again, you know. It, it just, and and the fact that, I like you could also get caught up with the idea. Well, well, Jesus was God. Of course, he did everything right. He's God, right? And here's Mary, who doesn't have a divine nature, who's not God, yet is, you know, without sin and is the queen of heaven. You know, so it, it she's even more relatable in a sense. You know, and and that she's not divine. Uh, so it's just a helpful image to have to lead us to Christ and say, you know, it is possible. You can live a holy life. And all the saints that have gone before, they're not dead because the, our God is a God of the living, not the dead. What do you think they do? Go to heaven and just go to sleep? You know, they're, they're with us. It even says in Revelation, is that, uh, I think it's Revelation. Yeah, where you see where the image is given of all the saints in prayer. You know, uh, I believe it's Paul says all the uh, saints in heaven rejoice over um, a sinner who repents and this kind of thing. So they're there with us. And so the only thing I can say is uh, to get our own lives straight. You know, start small with, the, with your local, where you are now, your family, your life. And then from there, you know, it'll go further. Yeah. I think you're right, especially when you see the world all around you just going to hell in a handbasket. You have those that don't even acknowledge sin anymore at this point in time. 
And again, I think there's been some political, cultural, social factors that have laid into that over the past several hundred years that have contributed to this attitude to where sacraments and the devotion of our ancestors through the analogy of the faith has been absolutely wiped out. And unless you're deep into church history and understand at least the most basic forms of theology and are willing to study and to learn, I think this is how we've reached a point of apostasy to no, where nobody believes in our own faith. And like I said before, I, I don't think it helps the fact that the God of indifferentism, which is pushed throughout all of our culture, um, it, it contributes to that mightily in a lot of different ways. And I think this is what Our Lady was trying to warn us about, particularly at Fatima. I think uh, she laid it out for us. I think she, she talked to us about a church that would be in turmoil, which would be the Catholic Church, of course. But their problems would sort of disseminate or descend in, down into the rest of, of the culture and the world and, and, and the people of the world, for that matter. Like I said so many times before, whenever the Catholic Church is healthy and strong, culture and the people of the world are healthy and strong. Whenever the church is weak, well, you know the rest of that. Um, that's why I say when I ran into ex-Catholics, Neil, that tell me, well, the church did this, the church did that, and, and the church is weak, and the church is screwing up here. My answer to them is always, well, um, the church in a state of weakness is not an argument necessarily against the church. In fact, it's an argument in favor of the church, because the church, when it was pristine, or not pristine, it's never pristine because of human influence, but when the church is in a state of strength, exactly, yes, when the church is in a position of strength itself, when it believes in its mission, when it believes in its own grace, when it believes in its own message, it resonates down to the laity. This is, a, uh, this is an apostasy that starts at the top. But at the bottom, we have our responsibilities. And Our Lady has given us those answers in many respects. It's the rosary, the first five Saturdays, Holy Communion, confession, and all the sacraments for that matter. And we're now living in a world that has disregarded the sacraments in a lot of different ways. Um, to me, the most important of the sacraments is the sacrament of confession, of course. And that is one, from what I understand, is virtually dead at this point in history. So few Catholics actually go to confession, never mind the Protestants who have opted out of that ideology completely, or at least mm -hmm. those principles completely. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think Our Lady laid it out, has been laying it out. She has been warning us. I don't think we should be shocked about the craziness we see in the world. So there you have it, my friend. Dio, buddy, thanks for joining me, my friend. My pleasure. All right, we'll be back online soon. Do another show pretty soon. This is Frank. Sign off for a nice Christian. Good night, everybody.